Well, thank you very much. Um, this book just came out. It's part of the ONR Underwater Acoustics uh, a series. And it's basically meant to try and simplify uh, and um, the, the large subject of ambient noise. So one of the things that I wanted to do in this talk is to um, not start off with the word according to uh, Wentz. Many people quote Wentz and then jump to the present, uh, ignoring all the work that's been done in between. This is uh, the table of contents of a special issue of JOE, April 2005, where Ole but goodies papers from the classified literature were republished in the journal. And they provide a nice benchmark for the ambient condition of the oceans in the 70s to 80s. Also, uh, here in, uh, is a list of um, reviews, proceedings, and whatnot, which are largely ignored by the community. And also in blue, uh, you'll see these references to the early 60s. Uh, there's actually a record made of marine mammal noise. And these can be gotten from the um, a naval uh, website for uh, training sonarmen. And so I uh, <clears throat> will make this available to anyone that wants it. Uh, now, starting with Wentz. <laughs> OK. Um, the first thing is, you'll notice uh, there's a couple of things that Wentz did. Uh, first, he used the Beaufort wind scale, wind force. And that's a significant thing. It's cheaper and easier to do a wind speed measurement from anywhere and not worry too much about it and just use that as your, your metric. But Wentz used the Beaufort scale. And uh, the other thing that Wentz did, and I put this up because it's something that's dear to my heart, it's something that I did in the 60s. You would print out, because plotting was so difficult uh, and contour plotting was impossible, what one did was made a, a printer a paper with numbers on it. And then um, hand drew, draw your, your contours. And this was actually done by Wentz and published in the, um, in the journal for some dates there that you can see showing the, the change. I can't see that now, but uh, um, over a three year period. And you can see the peaks and the valleys and the, the seasonal um, <clears throat> instrumentation. I suspect that anyone, any of the younger people here have no idea what this meant at the time. The Beaufort scale is interesting. And this is from Bowditch, which I always took to see when I was going to see. And on the, here you have the wind force. The um, table is very interesting because what it shows is the condition of the sea surface. The Beaufort scale is not only what the wind speed is or the wind speed range, it's what the sea surface looks like. And you know that on the equator in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, in the North Atlantic or the North Pacific, for the same wind speed, the sea surface appearance is remarkably different. And so the Beaufort scale sort of takes into account the differences. The reason for these differences is the, uh, what I call the air-sea interaction zone. And the tr traditionally, we use a, a, a logarithmic uh, profile. However, the condition has to do with the orbital motion uh, underneath the waves, the atmospheric turbulence above the waves, uh, the breaking of the waves, and of course, the, whether the temperature is increasing or decreasing in both above and below. Stability is a major importance as to how sound is produced at the surface of the sea. And this is a very busy view graph. It looks at the wind stress coefficients and a rationale for getting this logarithmic profile that has to do with moisture exchange, thermal transport, and um, drag or coefficient of drag or momentum exchange. And the only thing I would point out that there are three uh, things that are important. This sea, the sea surface spectrum, 
the Reynolds number and the Richardson number. And um, no one really measures those today. But one would think of, in a practical sense, of the temperature versus height. Is it stable or unstable? A moisture exchange, uh, is it hot and humid or dry? You know, those kinds of categories determine what the friction velocity is at the surface of the ocean, which determines the point at which waves break and determines how bubbles and spray and splash and stuff like that is used to, um, okay, oh, let me go back. So, not to get into a theoretical discussion, but given the fact that we've characterized the boundary condition appropriately and we know the critical wind speed, can we simplify the thousands of ambient noise reference, references into an analytical model that enables us to proceed? Well, first of all, we can take any compact noise source and represent it as a monopole or a dipole or a quadrupole. If we take a look at these things, then we see the first thing is that a fluctuating force across the boundary is a dipole. And that could be uh, impacts from splash, spray, or raindrops. A, a collection of oscillators below the pressure release surface will give us a, uh, if it's a monopole, it will look like a dipole. If it's a, a dipole, it will look like a quadrupole. And if it's a quadrupole, you're really not going to see it at a great distance. Okay, so examples, this would be an individual bubble below the pressure release surface or a group of bubbles. This would be turbulence underneath the pressure release surface. And this is um, uh, this a pseudo sound from the turbulence that doesn't propagate the distance because it's in this category here, can excite other bubbles to re-radiate. Now, the, the big phenomena which simplifies everything is the lloyd murray effect. And the most important thing down here is this approximation where you have 2 pi zs over lambda squared sine theta squared for the uh, intensity. And here's a, a nice color photograph. Here's the directionality and there's the geometry. And I like to use this simplified representation to describe a lot of phenomena. Keeping in mind the sea surface is rough. It's not a minus one keeping in mind that we have bubble distributions below the sea surface. And so the question is why would this kind of description uh, apply? And the reason is, is that what we measure in the ocean sort of looks like that. An example of what I'm talking about is a classic experiment that was done by um, Franz. And I got this from uh, uh, Fitzpatrick and um, Strasbourg, a, a Navy report that was done early on. This is a photograph of a large drop hitting a surface. You get an impact, and the impact is a force transfer across the press release surface, so it's a dipole. And then it shows the bubble forming, and then not quietly formed because it's too big, and then producing a little drop that goes up, and when the drop comes back down, it's the right size, it entrains a bubble, and you get this damp harmonic oscillator of a bubble below the pressure release surface, and that's also a dipole-like or a doublet. And so this is a typical kind of laboratory experiment which will describe what happens in the actual ocean for rain, sleet, snow, um, you name it. Now, uh, Wentz identified this he looked at this rain noise by Hinsman. And here it is. You see, you get these broad spectra. And uh, of course, when the rain is heavy, it changes. And that's because when we have rain, we have a mixture of the impact in the, in the bubble noise. Now, on the other hand, if you go to Dodge Pond, you go to any lake, and you put a hydrophone in the water, and it's just misting, you'll measure a spectra like this which shows just very light drops, small drops hitting the water, producing an entrained bubble that gives a characteristic frequency and, and whatnot. It's remarkable how easy it is to measure that effect. 
So now we go to once again and we look at the um, region below 20 hertz. Well, you see here is my definition of, of sound, 20 to 2,000, 20,000 is sonic, and then below that is infrasonic and, and whatnot. And so let's look at this region right in here. And the best paper that summarizes this very nicely is one by Kibblewhite. And he shows that you have a combination of, well, this is the called micro seismic peak. You have um, wave wave interaction, uh, which he attributes as the primary cause. Now, I, if Professor Pierce and others may think that it's a little bit different. Bob Urich thought it was a coupling between seismic energy in the bottom and whatnot. But anyway, this, this is the kind of uh, data that you have below 20 hertz. Of course, that's not primarily the focus of this talk. The focus of this talk is in this region, which Wentz labeled non-wind dependent. Now, is that true? Well, if one looks at that region, here's the pre previous stuff on that plot, and here's um, uh, Wittenborn in the uh, Pacific in the 72 time frame, the 76 time frame. And um, uh, Gus Wittenborn and I were colleagues in the LRAP program, which basically came out of this place. And we always have what they call the LRAP love-ins in the fall here until uh, uh, we were touted as being part of the Golden Fleece Awards, and so we had to cancel those. Um, but you see there's no difference in two different wind speeds for a hydrophone in the sound channel. This is the North Atlantic. You see it's a little longer, higher in noise level, um, and there's very little wind speed. And here's the Mediterranean, which is the highest. And of course, the levels depend upon the basin size. And so uh, this is representative of what you'd find in the, in the 70s, okay? And the reason for the lack of the wind speed dependence is that when you're in a shipping environment, the, ship, the ships block the noise at the low frequencies. And after you get to a higher wind speed, then the wind speed dependent comes in. And you can see this happens. This is from Pigott's data. I think it's Pigott, yeah. And uh, there it is. After you get above a certain frequency, you see the wind speed dependence. It was this kind of phenomena that led Wentz to say that in that region there was no wind speed dependence. The people at Dave Browning and Bill Von Winkle and others at the uh, us now, so the Underwater Sound Laboratory, uh, had a habit of doing measurements all over the world. And so here's the measurement that they did in the North Pacific, and here's one in the Fiji Basin in the South Pacific, showing the difference in levels that you can get. This South Pacific has a paucity of, of shipping. Consequently, one sees the effect of shipping, and over here at the lower frequencies, the presence of whales. And so whales, shipping, and wind are important. In fact, Wittenborn in the LRAP program in that time frame showed that for a hydrophone in the sound channel, you got very little wind dependence at the lower frequencies. But for one that was below critical depth near the bottom, one could see a wind speed dependent clear across the board. And the biggest one was this one here. Also at that time, they made measurements of the whale noise at the deep hydrophone and the one in the sound channel. And you can see the uh, power that's in a whales as they go. How many whales, how distant they were, that wasn't, um, the key thing was that based on earlier work, it was identified as whale nose because of the 20 hertz uh, phenomena. And so the, the key thing from uh, our point of view was, how do you produce sound from overhead at the low frequencies across this whole band? And the reason that we think that's important is because you can't really explain it with bigger bubbles. Now, if you ignore the difference between bubble formation in salt water and fresh water, you may be making the argument that bigger bubbles are the case. But I urge you to go put some numbers to it, because even if you ignore the differences between 
fresh and salt water, uh, one will find that the big bubbles can't describe what's observed. Now, Brian Kerman took the data of um, uh, Perone and reanalyzed it, and he came up with the following kind of a plot where the, uh, this is frequency. Above a, a certain uh, point, you see all of these different wind speeds fall in a continuous line, but below a certain frequency, it becomes very variable. And this caught my attention because this is a, a very important process. Also, he plotted the relative intensity as a function of the critical wind speed velocity and found that you had one frequency dependence prior to a certain point and another after a certain point. And this point, the critical uh, friction velocity that he identified corresponds to the points at which waves break. Now when waves break, a ph phenomenon occurs. You have uh, uh, initially, this is a time sequence of photographs showing the formation of a small distribution of bubbles, what I call a plume or a bubble cloud, and uh, becoming dispersive, and then forming a layer. The, um, in this case, this was uh, brackish water. The bubbles are big and so bigger than what you'd find in salt water, easy to photograph. And the, as the wave passes over, they stay trapped in the orbital motion of the wave below. Thorpe, uh, in 1982, also observed this kind of phenomena. And here's his upward-looking fathometer looking at the bubble clouds and plumes that were produced by breaking waves as it went as they go past his observation point. And um, you notice that he has a billowy type structure. He also observed that under another stability condition, the structure of the bubble clouds and plumes changed. A significant observation. So the supposition at the time was that micro bubble clouds and plumes could oscillate collectively, being trapped in the vorticity underneath the wave and radiate uh, sound at the lower frequencies, and that this could be sort of like a fractal phenomena going from individual bubbles to smaller groups, smaller groups, smaller groups, and at least it can, um, would explain the effect. Oh, <clears throat> now, given the fact that you have a single bubble or multiple bubbles underneath the pressure release surface, one would expect sort of like a dipole type of radiation pattern. Uh, Bob Kennedy in 1990, who worked for the Naval and Sea System Center, uh, did an experiment in, near the tongue of the ocean where he shows that before wave breaking, one has a, uh, this is the angle, uh, going directly um, um, down is over here, and, and um, this is zero degrees, and this would be like 90 degrees, and you see that this is around this little peak here, it's about 600 hertz, very little directionality uh, below that point. However, once waves begin to break, he finds that he has a dipole pattern at all frequencies. And so this is consistent with having a, an oscillator below the pressure release surface. The uh, idea that you could have bigger bubbles is problematic because the bubbles that are big enough to do this don't stay down there that long. And so even if you didn't have the um, difference between salt and fresh water, you couldn't do it. Now, in addition to this wave breaking phenomenon, Peter Villa in his group at the, in Germany uh, did a lot of experiments in the North Sea showing the variation of the um, sound pressure level versus their wind class. And you'll see that at the low frequencies, they have very little uh, frequency, wind speed dependence until they get above a certain wind speed. And at the mid frequencies, they have no wind dis dis speed dependence until they get up to a point where they start having breaking waves. And the same thing happens at the higher frequencies. But one of the things that happens at the higher frequencies, after they get to a certain uh, wind speed category of C state, 
category or a Beaufort force category, you see that the higher frequency stuff starts to attenuate. And this is attributed to the fact that when you have waves break and micro bubbles are produced, uh, some of them come up and they persist and you have white caps produced, but others stay in solution so that one would have at a higher sea state an exponential bubble layer uh, near the surface. And so sound that's produced in that bubble layer is attenuated and that's the reason for this downturn. And so that the net result of all of these investigations that have been repeated by many papers, many investigators in the journal, you'll see that there's a region where there's very little, a transition region, and then a high sp wind speed region. And then you have uh, this phenomena, which is due to trapping and absorption. And so from a higher frequency point of view, we have a very good feel for what's going on in the ambient noise. The other side of this is a guy by the name of Wilson proposed that you characterize ambient noise not by wind, but by white cap coverage. And so this shows our previous uh, wind speed uh, stress coefficient and wind speed versus uh, the stress coefficient and um, I forget what that is, white cap coverage versus the um, wind speed. And, and you have very little happening below. Waves begin to break. You go through a transition region, and you come up to a constant wind stress condition. And the white cap coverage depends upon that. And uh, here's a little table that gives you the um, um, result. Now, the question that's posed by this is, this, does this lend uh, investigators to use satellites? Okay. And if you have a satellite, should you use wind speed or should you use wind speed and white caps to determine um, the um, <clears throat> state of the sea and the production of ambient noise? Now, white caps persist in salt water. Wakes persist in salt water much longer than in fresh water. And the reason is because in salt water, when the bubbles are born, the electro uh, static electromagnetic forces cause repulsion and they stay small which means they don't rise to the surface quite as fast. In fresh water where you don't have these effects you get bubble coale coalescence and the larger bubbles rise faster so you have less time for white cap or wake. Now in respect to the ambient noise one also has to think about the directional effects. Uh, this is a, um, a favorite little diagram that I like to use. It's, a, it's an artist's version of Anderson's 1972 work with, um, from, uh, with Edelbult from the Naval uh, Undersea Center in um, San Diego. Uh, it was done in the North Atlantic and it used a a maximum likelihood processing. And for the time, it was an unusual kind of event. Here you have the angle. This is the horizontal. And here you have frequency. And it was a vertical array. And you see that there's a plateau until you get to a certain frequency. And then it uh, decreases and there's a valley. And then there's these peaks, which are the so far angles. And in the middle here is a sound source that was off of Eleuthera. And uh, as you get to a higher frequency, you start getting aliasing effects. And so this is the so-called notch phenomena. It's a deep ocean phenomena. And of course, militarily, it was very interesting because if you can look down the notch, you can uh, um, get better detections. Here are some vertical slices through that. You see at the low frequency, there's a pedestal along the horizontal, but at the high frequencies, you have these peaks at the so far axis and a uh, minimum at this, uh, along the horizontal. Now, my colleague Richard Nevins and I, in um, Botsy's, in um, Jim Davis, 
uh, Jim Davis used to be at Woods Hole at one time, uh, did a series of uh, ex numerical experiments. They were unfunded, so they aren't as detailed as you would like, and you'll never see Richard showing this diagram, so, <laughs> you know, take that for your grand result. So here's your sources that we put close to the surface, simply close enough to have that dipole-like radiation pattern. And here's an estimate of the continental shelf. Okay, and here's the sound velocity profile and the array in the middle. And at low frequencies, we get a nice broad pedestal. And at the high frequencies, we get these so far peaks in the men. And that's due to the reflectivity of the slope. Uh, energy that hits the slope is converted by twice the slope angle into the horizontal times the reflectivity of the bottom loss of the slope. The bottom loss at the slope is higher at higher frequencies than at low frequencies. So the slope acts as a low pass filter having a broad pedestal along the horizontal and a uh, valley um, at the higher frequencies. There was a competing idea uh, on this and that was that the shallowing sound channel uh, in the South Atlantic and the uh, Pacific uh, would give the same effect. And indeed, one could get an effect. The order of magnitude was not as great as this. Now the other side of this was, what about the horizontal directionality? And this is something which I think is important from the current day. This is the North Atlantic, and this is the Gulf of Mexico. I, the measurements were made in 1979. And in both cases, the locations of um, ships and um, oil wells were uh, recorded. Uh, we had a guy that, uh, Dr. Lou Solomon, who flew a lot of flights to count ships. and. Um, and the idea was to show that uh, in, there was a fundamental directional persistent pattern for a given part of the ocean depending on what the industrial activity was. And here you see the two, uh, the Gulf of Mexico and the North Atlantic. Now, this is a measurement that I didn't do, but that Ron Wagstaff did. And this is um, in the Northeast Pacific, again showing the distribution proportional to the shipping distribution. And by the way, he found that he could predict it with the average density of ships. Now, he could adjust the level, okay, to get it to agree, but he didn't get absolute agreement. And I think the reason is, is that we don't know what the source levels of the ships are. We did um, a series of experiments um, in the Mediterranean in the 80 time frame. This was 1982. This is my favorite experiment because Homer Buca had to go home and he entrusted me to use his equipment. <laughs> and that was a major thing for Homer. Uh, but we did mo noise measurements at all these different locations. This location is very interesting because it's the Ionian Basin. We have noise data in this basin from 1962 to 1982 and Finn Jensen from uh, the NERC, the center in Italy, has sent me recent data from the 90s. It's a closed basin. Uh, this is the, we did our measurements here. At the time, we didn't know about the line of death and looked at this whole area. Okay. Um, the, uh, if you take an array and back it up to a place where there's not much shipping, and you look at it versus times, one sees uh, ship tracks evolving. And if you correlate between these two, you can tell that this one is independent from that and whatnot. And this discrete shipping noise background is superimposed on these lighter areas, which are the residual noise background. So this is a perfect shipping environment. Likewise, in the um, Northeast Pacific, 
if one takes a, a calculation here, and here's the velocity profile, one can calculate by doing 2D slices and projections, um, which I'm not going to cover today, and get a, um, a vert vertical, here's the horizontal, uh, this is the vertical direction versus uh, true bearing. And you can see that it's a azimuthal bearing and whatnot. And what determines a lot of the, the directionality we see is the presence of slopes, continental slopes, seamounts, and those kinds of things. Because every time the sound hits the slope of the seamount, it reflects it twice the angle, gets into the horizontal, and propagates at a great distance. Uh, one of the items that is characteristic of, of this work, and uh, I have to point out that these are laborious calculations done on a uh, small PC in Richard's basement, <laughs> Richard Evans' basement. And um, so here's a satellite distribution of the 10 meter wind speed that is obtained from the Kwiksak satellite. And this is a two spot gigahertz uh, radar that they have an empirical or semi-empirical uh, algorithm to go from the Doppler shifts that they measure to wind speed. And they routinely estimate the 10 meter wind speed all around the Earth. How good it is depends because as most people who have worked with radar know, the scattering from the surface depends in a large way on the humidity flux and drops and sprays and stuff like that. But, and, and so this is why the question I ask is, is it to, um, it, would it be better to use this in conjunction with white cap coverage, not only the, uh, the wind speed coverage. But nevertheless, the uh, wind speed using uh, source level curves that uh, Doug Cooley and Browning and group used uh, based on the Pacific stuff where a vertical array looks straight up at the surface and they characterize the noise production as a function of wind speed and frequency. These curves times the 10 meter wind speed give us the source level distribution of the ambient noise. And if one has a vertical array one and does the 2D slices 360 degrees with the, uh, uh, you know, the, the way this is done is extrapolating a, uh, an array onto a straight line and doing the conventional beamforming. One gets uh, a um, low sound region, high region when you have slope activity. All, all this is determined by bathymetry. Likewise, if we look at the um, shipping, this is the shipping density multiplied by canonical wind speed. Now, if you happen to have been brought up as a Catholic, canons are very important. But if you are a scientist, you say, where did that come from? Okay. And so the, that, that question mark is that right now, I do not believe that we know a lot about this uh, surf, surf ship source levels. Um, one of the interesting things is there was in the late 70s, a guy named Cybaleski who ran with the, and Steve Wales was a graduate student at NRL and did the, um, a big program to measure source levels on ships, the ships that were available then, okay? And of course, you see other papers from BBNN in the journal by Gray and Greeley and Averson on sh source levels. And the, 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 the idea is that as the propeller of the ship goes from high, high, high pressure to low pressure, and there's a cavitation bubble mass, the cavitation bubble mass oscillates and you get radiated sound, okay? And so that's the basic mechanism. And I think it's um, a, a, a doable thing. 
However, I put this question mark because the kinds of ships that we're dealing with now are radically different. Okay? And there's no reason to believe that the radiation efficiency is the same. Okay? But here, if you take these things, and now you look at the vertical directivity. Now, keep in mind that this is a misleading plot because if to just do it relative to the, the previous one, one would have to um, keep the scales the same. This is far more energetic. The scale is just um, uh, different. But it shows the effect of shipping. And here again, you have this area and this area here as um, the ships. And Richard's probably going to kill me because I can never uh, keep in mind uh, exactly uh, what the bearing is in degrees. I think 360 is uh, due north, right, Richard? Correct. Right, okay. And the ships coming in and out of the Alaskan border. Yeah. And, um, yeah, 360 is due north, and um, uh, this is north, this is north, and 180 is due south. So you're looking down this way, and you don't see a lot of contribution from the ships because there's no bathymetry there. Okay. Likewise, in the Philippine Sea, there's a calculation that was done, and the reason we picked this location was because it was the site of the earlier Wittenborn array. And so uh, we here again is the shipping density, uh, showing it uh, times the, um, the source levels. Um, and you can see the, when, when the ship is over a bathymetry line or something, its source level is increased by what they call the megaphone effect or the slope enhancement effect or those kinds of things. And then here is the same thing with the uh, Kwikset uh, wind dependent source levels where uh, this represents an area a storm or high wind speed. And again one could show the the effects and this is um, a comparison of uniform noise in distributed noise showing the vertical directionality is closely the same. This is with a, uh, a, a bottom on the slopes and the thing with a 30 degree critical angle. What is the bottom reflectivity of the slopes? It's largely unknown. You know, the numbers that, the, that we use are basically inferred numbers. But the actual value of the slopes are unknowns. And if you change, well, this is the shipping source distribution, the bottom from a 30 degree to a 10 degree bottom, one can see a huge change in the vertical and horizontal directionality. So there are two unknowns that govern our ability to calculate the deep ocean ambient noise level are the shipping source level and the bottom reflectivity both of which can be easily done now with the kind of towed array and vehicle that we developed here at Woods Hole because it's a cost-effective way of doing that. And in fact, Jason Holmes, my graduate student, did precisely that with the ferry as it came in and out of, the, of Nantucket Sound. So here's a, a topic of, of interest to uh, current investigators, and that has to do with um, Ross's result. And uh, Don Ross's paper and Rudy Nichols' paper from the 70s, uh, from a Woods Hole symposium in the 70s, and it was in the, either the classified portion or whatnot, um, I've reprinted, uh, and Ross edited it uh, for JOE. And so here's his idea of the what will happen as a function of time uh, and he shows the um, total um, um, radiated noises of uh, was that total is I can't read that that's a number of, number ships. of ships number of ships versus 
the total number of shifts versus year, and the fact that he has a plot showing the ambient noise levels to this particular point. You'll notice that in 1980, the, uh, my measurements were 88, and they're close to that. However, most recent results for the 90s are still in that ballpark. I don't know of anyone who's measured um, above 95 dB anywhere, except when I made measurements in the uh, Taiwan, the Straits of Korea, and it was 100 uh, dB rear micropascal squared per hertz. Okay, so that was a, a key thing. And so the question is what happens with this curve as you go out? Now there's no doubt that the, no the oceans are getting noisier. The question is how much? And if we go at half a dB per year, okay, and we go 30 years, you're talking another 15 dB, so you're, everything's over 100 dB. I don't believe that's happening. Okay? I think what's happening is that it's increasing, but the efficiencies of the machines are decreasing. And we simply don't know what the source levels are. We don't know what the source levels are for wind turbines, oceanic wind turbines, uh, oil platforms, um, ships, um, air guns. Air guns are perhaps the biggest source of ambient noise. When I was doing ambient noise measurements in the Med in 1982, I said to my colleague Jim Reese, I said, I wish they'd shut those air guns off so we could make some ambient noise measurements. <laughs> uh, Bill, what frequency is that? Um, this is, his stuff is 50 and 100 hertz, or 150 hertz. And he takes, um, I think this is pretty much 50 hertz. But the whole point is it's a half a dB per year. Everybody's looking for a half a dB per year. I'm sure they'll find something, but it's not clear. And it's not clear to me that you could use this without a modeling activity to calculate what you measure so you know what you're really measuring. Okay, for example, if you do the measurement on the edge of the continental shelf, are you measuring just the deep sea or are you getting a lot of the coastal activity which has really gone up because of the uh, economic utilization of the um, coastal waters for pleasure and commercial activities. In uh, New England, uh, and, and a lot of the debates we have about the sound in the coastal areas of New England have to do with the fact that pleasure boating is a, a major activity. So here's what a, a typical 12-ton tanker looked like in 1976. And it's just so happened that it passed over the um, LRAP site, and this is the hydrophone that was below critical depth when the freighter wasn't there, and here it is as the freighter passed over. And it shows a classic kind of spectrum. It peaks in the 50 to 100 hertz. You see these large spikes at the lower frequencies, which have to do with the, the blade rates. And then up here you see this continuous spectrum, which is a cavitation spectrum, and below that you'll find the lines from various machines and that kind of stuff. And the source level for this was um, about 170 dB rear micropascal per hertz. I might make po a point that many of the graphs that I've shown in this presentation had hertz to the one half. There's no such thing as hertz to one half, but the convention that was used in the 60s and 70s was to do a micropascal in a one and, and a micropascal squared in a one hertz band, and when you turned it into RMS, it became a micropascal per per square root of hertz. Um, and it's also confusing because if you see a micropascal in a one hertz band, you may be not having the same thing. It may be that there's the measurement of the pressure in a one hertz band 
Okay, so um, one has to be careful. I always use now micropascal squared per hertz because as you know, a decibel is the ratio of power and the um, <coughs> uh, power is proportional to pe pressure squared. And so we usually do a mean squared uh, pressure measurement in a one hertz band. Okay, so here's the, the beast. Now I've been going to the Department of Commerce and all kinds of shipping things and uh, getting back down to uh, real engineering. And it's, it's sort of embarrassing to, to know what real engineering is and what your knowledge is. But these, these ships all have different drives and different displacements. And um, this is a, a, a Ling ship and uh, it's um, all electric propulsion. Uh, and the other interesting thing about these ships, these tankers and the container ship, is that the, the container ships, for the large part, just have a single hull with a rack inside. And they shove the containers down in. They don't even have a hold. They don't cover it up. If water gets in, they pump it out. OK? And each one of these things has different types of propellers. And the propellers, when Ross did his thing, were less than four meters in diameter. Now the propellers go up to nine meters in diameter, OK? The uh, manufacturer of the propellers is ra radically different. Um, and so if we look at this, you know, Ross did his stuff. All, all his stuff was 12 ton, under 20 dead weight tons or something. And um, so here we have now different categories of ships. And uh, I have a, here's the evolution. This is the kind of ship that, um, this is not original stuff. This is copied out of a variety of naval engineering books. Uh, this shows the evolution. This is sort of like what you would have in the, um, in the 70s. And you can see what happens. And uh, it just dramatically increases. And look at the new bills. Now, one has to, um, TEU is 20 foot equivalent units, which I forget all the time. And dead weight ton has a specific definition. And so one has to be careful about the units and who's given them to you and define them. But the, the real question that I ask is what is the radiation efficiencies of these vessels? Now think about the fact that if you're producing sound here, what you see above is air, steel, air, water. Four, you see the, the hull, and it shadows you in the forward direction. In the back, you see a wake, which persists for a time, which is like a slow waveguide. And so you're going to have a sh shading in the back. So in the horizontal, sound will peak in this direction. And in the vertical, it's going to peak in the downward direction. And so the next question is, I mean, we're still going to be close to the surface. We're still going to have like a dipole radiation pattern in the vertical. We'll have sort of like a, a, a cookie cutter radiation pattern in the horizontal. Um, and it's sort of like the reason why whales can't hear these things coming because they're in a shadow zone of the of the tanker. And, um, but the question is, what is the radiation efficiency? And it will depend on the cavitation um, of the propeller. And so here you see the uh, dead weight tons from the AFRA scale. And, and then there's the flexible market scale. And um, you can see that we're really a long way from the, uh, this category when we start dealing with these. And so the actual tonnage may have very little to do with the number of ships because we have so many big ships. There's about eight categories. Here's an example of the sound machine for each one of these ships. 
and you see some of them have two propellers, some of them have shrouded propellers. This is a huge propeller with six blades. And this one, all these propellers are precision machine now to reduce the inefficiency and the results of cavitation. So one would really need to worry about this. Now, Bob Frost said, but all it takes is one nick. And I was surprised to find out that on most of these big ships, when they're in port, they hire people to polish the propellers. <laughs> okay? And so, Mike, I don't have an answer to this. I'm working on this right now. What is the radiation from these things? And so wet cargo, we have the following. And um, so that's about it. I, I'll give a copy of this to anybody that uh, wants it. And um, that's all I have to say. Yeah. I have a question on the, you showed the uh, wind, uh, satellite wind mass, mm -hmm. say from quick scatter, a yeah. scatterometer, and you implied that the measurement and the estimation of the wind is dependent on these other environmental parameters, yeah. like the stability and so on. Yeah. Is it possible that the raw data that come back are maybe more closely related to the acoustic effects because of a correlation I, between the acoustic mm -hmm. effects and You see, I, uh, let me... I, I, I like to do two things. Like, I like to understand how the data was taken and what theoretical model or calculations being done to, as the basis of the quicksat. And Richard and I have spent a lot of time looking for references. And it's um, very difficult to find a lot of published data on this. Uh, as near as I can tell, the uh, quicksat ground two thing was done at one particular area where they measured stuff on the surface and measured the scattered field on the satellite. Now there's no doubt in my mind that because they've got this empirical relationship uh, that in that area it is going to work, but will it work in the tropics? Uh, if, if I, what I'm saying is that the humidity flux and the uh, heat transfer is important, then one might have to worry about that a little bit. I know I ran a periscope detection problem one time, and my boss said to me, well, you know, they're, you're a physicist, and these guys are way ahead of the underwater sound guys. They know this stuff. And I was shocked to find out that they were 10 years behind. <laughs> okay. In your slide, you show that when the wind speed exceeds certain speed, mm -hmm. and the uh, noise, e.g., the bubble, mm -hmm. is dominant. Mm -hmm. But is there any uh, bubble sound due to the ship itself? When ship goes, it makes the breaking wave and also couple okay. of Let me. You're right. Any possible mechanism that you can talk about uh, on the uh, most uh, sound sources at the sea is doable. What I've tried to do is a dramatic s simplification to major sources. For example, when you have the bow wave of the ship that you're talking about, it produces sound. There's no doubt about it. The question is how much does that compare with what's in the back of the ship? Okay, there's no doubt about it. You can also have sound transmitted through the hull because of the rotating machinery inside the ship. It's uh, usually the higher frequencies, and the reason that I um, don't pay much attention to it is because in all the ships that I worked on, I always saw this cavitation specter at the high frequency. And if I had the captain of the ship declutch, so we kept going, uh, I would see the cavitation noise go down and the, these lines that were buried in there arrive from the, the fans and the heads and the pumps and all this other stuff. And so it's there, it's just that, you know, like the major problem is the, is the cavitation spectrum, in my opinion. 
I, 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 I'd be glad somebody proved me wrong or educate me on it. Yes? Actually, I'm very interested in, in one point you brought up is the term uh, wind turbine, mm -hmm. the offshore uh, mm -hmm. wind farm. And do you think that the, the known wind could be certainly will penetrate into mm -hmm. water? In the mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, do you think it will make the, the impact will be in the global scale or just localized? Mm -hmm. Well, th th that's an interesting problem. And I've been after Jim Lynch and others here to take a, a Remus AUV with that little array that we had or one of the others that you have around here and go to an existing wind farm and make some measurements. Uh, for example, if you have some measurements close to the wind turbine so you know how, what the coupling is in the water and, and then you measure it as it goes out, you'll have sort of like a very interesting experiment to determine what the noise production of a, a wind turbine would be before they build them in, in, in Nantucket Sound. Now, uh, Alan Pierce, Greg McDaniels, and um, uh, 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 Cheryl Grace uh, are trying to quantify that problem. You know, my, they're going to do a more theoretical approach than I would as an experimentalist. I would like to see some empirical data. And I have to point out that for one of the problems with ship noise levels, oil well noise levels, uh, all kinds of production platform noise wells, including wind turbines, is because the experience in the 70s and early 80s was that the cost associated with doing these measurements was huge. Now, the measurements I did had arrays between 640 and 3,000 kilometers. You can't feel too many of those. And so, on the other hand, when you have um, an AUV that can change depths, and um, you know, for example, when the super tank is going to come by, all you have to do is put it below it, and on a collision course, it'll go right underneath, and you have more data on the source level of that ship than most other people ever dreamt of getting, and it's cost effective. Likewise, with the wind farms, it's cost effective. And so the, the ability to do these kinds of measurements is here. We just need uh, a sponsor to make it happen. But presumably, a wind turbine in reasonably shallow water is a very complex source. Yes. You've got, you got the acoustics in the air. Mm -hmm. You've got whatever spectrum mm -hmm. the propeller and the machinery induces mm -hmm. in the shaft. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you got the breathing motions of the cylinder itself. It, it, you know, and, and it, it is a complex source. That's why I advocate doing a, a good class of measurements because wouldn't it be nice if one could say, here's the dominant things that we have to worry about, and here's what the far field looks like from these sources. Because once we get away from the near field and we look at under a given set of conditions, what the energy level is a function of depth in the shallow water waveguide, we can always say what's going to happen as it propagates. I ran into one Italian paper that measured the seismic noise from a wind farm uh, 10 kilometers away. Mm -hmm. so that was a reasonable source. Yeah. Was that on land or air? On land. Yeah. And in fact, uh, Ken Foot came to my lab yesterday to pick up some transducers and one of the things that I have um, is about 10 microphones. Uh, my goal was to instrument um, a series of uh, microphones away from a wind turbine on land and make uh, routine measurements of the, of the noise from like a fraction of a hertz up. You but, uh, pardon? Idea. Pardon? I also have the same idea. Because well, you want my transducers? You want my microphones? We also have many hydrophones right now. Through blog posts and uh, whole channel one array and yeah. some uh, larger aperture. Yeah. And we can put in smart beat station. Sure. Well, I just gave uh, uh, Art Newhall had um, three PC 104s of it. Uh, Art, those data acquisition cheap. 
they were old, but they still work. And I, I was going to use them for, for this process. And one could, uh, for very little money, put 15 and 20 sensors out around a wind turbine and record all the data on a PC and, and use MATLAB to, you wouldn't have to use computer printouts, you could use MATLAB. <laughs> yes? It is certainly in the interest of the shipping companies to uh, operate their propellers below the cavitation limit, of course, but it seems that the effect on radiated noise is very much uncertain, whether that increased efficiency of operation yeah. well, is going to produce more or less. Um, they have their own efficiency curves for these propellers as a function of speed. And I have yet to see any of them relate that to cavitation. Um, that's why, uh, but I'm getting data on the RPM, the diameter of the propeller, the number of blades, and whatnot. And I can relate that kind of stuff to cavitation. I think that they all cavitate. It's a question of how much and how big is the bubble volume. And, um, and um, I don't know. Yes. 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 Are yeah, when they when they run empty, the propellers are sometimes out of the water. Yeah. You know. You know, I mean, it, it's a uh, all's my whole point is that just applying half a dB per year as the increase in noise levels of the ocean is maybe not a wise thing to do. That there is an increase. I know there's an increase, but it doesn't seem to be half a dB per year, and it may not do, be due to economic activity. It may be due to the difference in the ships and, and, and how they run now and, 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 and whatnot. Yeah, I, would, I would comment that it's, to me it's a bit like the stock market. The past performance is not an indicative of future, future. performance. They tell you that on all the perspectives. <laughs> and also, I, I think just measuring the noise in a location without estimating what the components of the noise are with some sort of calculation can give you a misleading result, especially with the increased use of coastal activity for pleasure boating, fishing, those kinds of things. Um, we're approaching the end. I have just a final comment. It's something that I might have said in the introduction. And, uh, Bill's actually rather famous for having identified low frequency oscillations as a source of that peak in the noise spectrum. And that's um, widely accepted, and you're famous for that. <laughs> the infamous, yeah. infamous. <laughs> but thank you uh, very much, Bill. Thank you. <laughs> There's one left on Amazon for 106. But <laughs> But if you buy it from Springer, it's 129, 126. <laughs> <laughs>